please join me in welcoming Mariana Mazzucato. Well, thank you very much. And thanks especially to Ed, Rick, and Jonathan, and um, well, all of you for being here. And I must say that Ed's speech was not only absolutely inspiring, but also has perfectly set up basically what I want to say. Because the challenge across the world today is not just to achieve you know, any kind of growth or by any means necessary. It's to achieve growth that is smart, so innovation-led, not based on speculation, which is actually still going out of the roof. We have the Fortune 500 companies that in the last 10 years have spent $3 trillion worth on just buying back their stock to boost their share prices, to boost their stock options, to boost executive pay. That is not the kind of investment we want. We want them to reinvest their profits in human capital and R&D. That's what I mean by smart, innovation-led growth. We want growth that is more inclusive the statistics, the numbers that Ed just gave just tell you just how uninclusive growth has been. And by the way, growth was plenty smart and innovation led in the 1990s, but if you look at the inequality data in Canada, in uh, the US, in many European countries, inequality was rising then as well. Thank you. Um, so I can actually move the slides at some point. Um, <laughs> you won't have to look at the lion and the pussycat the whole time. Um, and we want growth that is sustainable. Climate change also, it's getting worse. We are at the tipping point. It will soon become irreversible. And the biggest crisis, and what I want to talk to you about, and what Jonathan really uh, set up also very well by quoting Tony Judd, we have a complete crisis of thought, a crisis of thinking. We have no clue how to talk about the role of the public sector. And without the public sector, without the state, and when I talk about the state, I mean all of its organizations, agencies, and some countries it's quite decentralized, some countries it's more top down, but the point is the public sector has in the past been absolutely essential to thinking about change. And today, because we have a crisis, we have a completely, as Jonathan was saying, maligned state. This is a massive problem because those three challenges of SMART inclusive, sustainable growth will not happen with this depiction that you see here on the slide, which is a complete fabrication, right? So we have a dynamic, creative, innovative private sector. That's the guy on the left there. And the guy on the right, Kafka, that's the state, bureaucratic, inertial, you know, necessary, but ugh, gotta get them sort of out of the way. Now, this, I also wanna say, because I also found the, um, the speech by the two chiefs of the First Nations, very inspiring. This is a fabrication which reminds me, because I actually studied history when I was in university, of uh, uh, different types of fabrications over history, and specifically during the Mexican-American War, to justify, let's call it the theft, right, of New Mexico, California, and Texas, which were actually part of Mexico, okay, to justify that theft, we all of a sudden, almost overnight, during that period, started to be fed this cartoon image, a fabricated image of the lazy Mexican, right? So the Mexican, sombrero, under a palm tree, a bit tired. That was a cartoon image that was fabricated precisely during that period to justify that theft. And what I want to argue now is, and I'm going to get to this especially at the end when I talk a bit about inequality, is that this image here, which we are fed every day, um, unfortunately, also by the progressive uh, uh, forces around the world who say, yes, we need a state, but why, Be, you know, to nurture this wonderfully innovative business sector we have, um, that this image is currently not only wrong, not only hurting the kind of investments we need, but is actually feeding inequality, and in that sense, it is feeding uh, this theft of the public investments, which in fact have in the past been absolutely essential and will be essential today. Now, what do I mean by uh, this being wrong? What I mean is that we often are fed this image of you know, this very creative and innovative business sector, which is being constrained, it's been impeded, it's in a cage. It would like to invest, but can't because of different types of impediments like tax, like regulation. 
The reality is, if you look at the history of investments, especially those, and I'm going to focus a lot on innovation because that's what I do. I'm an economics of innovation person. Um, uh, those countries and, and those businesses that really have invested, they've invested not because it was more profitable because the costs went down. Uh, by the way, the best person to talk about this is Warren Buffett. He's often saying, you know, I've never made an, um, an investment because it was cheaper, because somehow taxes were low. He mentions 1976 uh, when the capital gains tax was 40% in the US. He said, that did not impede my investment. I invest when I see all these opportunities. And Keynes himself, the theorist who really kind of justified the role of government, he as well talks about, you know, that what drives business investment are not just interest rates and taxes, but what he called animal spirits, which means the gut instincts about where the future market and technological opportunities are. Unfortunately, though, that word, animal spirits, you know, does make you think of this, this lion here, and that didn't really serve him well, that word. And in fact, in a wonderful letter, um, and I was told I had too many slides, by the way, so the letter was there, but I had to take up out about 20 slides because they had to be translated into French, and this particular slide got very full. But this wonderful letter that Keynes wrote to Roosevelt um, in 1936 where he says, uh-oh, they ain't wolves, they ain't tigers, they're not lions. Often what we have are domesticated animals in the business sector. We have gerbils. We have pussycats. Now, he did not say this, you know, to bash business. He was just saying, uh-oh, the challenge for government is massive, okay? The challenge is to get these pussycats to grow into this lion. Uh, it is not to assume it and simply to facilitate. Let's get up these animal spirits. Let's create them. And this is exactly what has happened in places like Silicon Valley. And there's countries all over the world. I mean, I live in London. We've just built Silicon Roundabout. Pretty depressing word, yes, but that is what we're calling it. It's actually called Tech City, but the short word for us is uh, Silicon Roundabout. Um, it's more interesting. Um, now, the, the, the problem is that when we try to copy Silicon Valley, we think, oh yes, what do we need to do? We need venture capital, right? That's, that's the big hero. We need, again, to reduce taxes because that's gonna make these businesses invest. And the problem is that almost every Silicon Valley company, and I'm going to focus here on Apple, but I could tell you the story with Google, um, Google's, uh, well, anyway, I'll tell you the story later. Uh, all these companies have, in fact, surfed, and they're you know, mainly in California, so they do lo uh, lots of surfing, surfed massive waves of public sector investment. Uh, this is the story of the iPhone that I tell in my book, um, which... Uh, is outside, but apparently there's only five copies. They haven't arrived, so if anyone's interested, you'll have to fight for one. But I tell the story in my book where every single technology that makes the iPhone so smart and not idiotic was funded by the public sector. Internet, GPS, touchscreen display, and even this button that never works on my phone, but this Siri thing that you can talk into, all government funded. Then, of course, you need the entrepreneurs to think up really cool ways to put those technologies um, into products that then you want to buy, and Steve Jobs was a genius in that respect. But the problem today is that by constantly talking about the state as just getting away, we are in fact putting the kinds of investments that in fact led to all these technologies under risk. Um, and, uh, you know, often people say to me, oh, but you're just talking about, uh, you know, the military industrial complex, because in fact, lots of these agencies here, the, the, you know, DARPA, which basically funded all the internet, was Department of Defense. Uh, the CIA, by the way, has one of the biggest uh, public venture capital funds in the world. People don't know this, InQtel, which was uh, helped fund uh, touchscreen display. And really, the point is, you know, no, you know, yes, lots of it was for military spending, but in fact, if you look across the different departments in the U.S., this is the data for the National Institutes of Health, they have in fact used that model. And what is fascinating is not just the scale. This shows you that in 2012, you know, during the austerity, um, even in 2012, the U.S. government spent $32 billion just on this one sector, pharma slash biotech. And what's fascinating about these investments also is that they don't just do what economists talk about, which is you know, solve little market failures here and there. 
Uh, they don't just solve the public good problem, right? So basic research is a public good. Why? Because the spillovers are so high, it's really hard to appropriate the returns to that kind of spending, and so the government has to come in and, and spend on the basic science. Very few people disagree with that. But actually, what the government did in all those investments behind the iPhone was not just the basic research. It was even the applied research, and it was even early stage seed financing of companies themselves. Um, this is the line on the pussycat, I'll get to that later. This is showing you these public venture capital funds which actually funded companies. So Compaq, Intel, they received their early stage finance, not from early stage venture capital, from private venture capital, but from these SBIR funds. Uh, Apple got 500K in the very early period from an SBIC grant. Um, and you know, why is this also interesting? Because as you see, it's been going up over time. This compares private and public VC, venture capital, early stage financing in the US. And what's, you know, why is this? because of what often people talk about, financialization. Not only are companies themselves, unfortunately, hoarding their money, spending a lot of the money on share buybacks, which is, again, just boosting stock prices, stock options, executive pay, but the financial sector, as we know, has just fed itself. Banks were lending to different types of you know, other uh, financial institutions, venture capital, uh, became only focused on, or is only focused on, the exit. They invest in order to exit to make money. How long are they willing to wait? Three to five years. Forget the five, actually. That's, that's the old days. That's long term. Uh, three years, they want that to happen, mainly through an IPO, an initial public offering in the stock market. Now, what this has led to is all these, what I call, plepos, uh, actually, it's Bill Lazonic's word, my colleague, uh, productless IPOs in industries like biotech, because in industries like biotech, clean tech, nanotech, um, it, uh, the emerging uh, you know, green economy, um, IT, innovation takes 15 to 20 years. And private finance is not willing today to wait that long. And in fact, if we look at the emerging uh, green economy that, again, Ed was talking about, he says we want sustainable growth, that upper right-hand quadrant there, which is the really high-risk space, okay, I have capital intensity of projects on the vertical axis and technological and market risk on the horizontal, that upper right-hand quadrant has almost no private investment. In fact, there's some really wonderful databases out there. One of these is uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And if you look at that uh, database and just calculate around the world all the private money, so this is stock market, private equity, venture capital, corporate investments going into green. Um, in 2011, I think the figure was 11.5 billion. 2012, it was something like 12.5 billion. And just the public banks around the world, so KFW in Germany, BNDS in Brazil, uh, the European Investment Bank, and especially the big player today is the China Development Bank. China is no longer just going down the low wage route. They are the biggest investors today in the green economy. They're also spending $1.7 trillion in these five emerging sectors, of which three are very green. Anyway, this, this tall uh, bar here shows you the amount that development finance institutions uh, spent, $123 billion. Um, now, what's interesting is that these banks are not, you know, they're actually playing this massive role. This is the data for the German bank. They really are doing what Keynes said, but they're doing much, much more. What Keynes said, John Maynard Keynes, um, is that, you know, government should be anti-cyclical, not pro-cyclical. In other words, business, in the boom, spends too much, in the bust, spends too little, so what you need is government to do the opposite. It's kind of like common sense, right? But I mean, he also modeled it, he thought about it in a very deep way. What we're witnessing today across the world because of this you know, strong ideological bent towards austerity is the opposite. We have governments acting like business, you know, cutting during the bad times, um, which gets us into depressions. You know, recessions which come every now and then from just the business cycle shouldn't lead to the kind of depressionary dynamics that we've witnessed. But when the whole, uh, well, much of the West starts having this dogma that government just has to get out of the way and that government caused the crisis, when we all know that it was private, not public debt, that caused the crisis, 
Um, this has got us into a big mess, but what's interesting is the few countries around the world that today are actually growing, seriously growing, and not just little blips because we're fueling some sort of housing crisis, which I hear is going to be your future very soon, where you're simply trying to grow by making it easier to take out loans uh, to buy houses as opposed to facilitate you know, actual new house creation, which in places like uh, London is also a big deal. We are facilitating debt, not actually constructing new houses. Um, What's, what, what's interesting is that these countries, and I would really kind of name them because there's not that many, it is kind of Germany, Denmark, Finland, Brazil, China, they not only have these counter-cyclical policies, um, but they have the, the right institutions, public institutions, that are able to really think up these new missions. Um, so this is the German Investment Bank, which as you see here is counter-cyclical, but it has, often, it has also focused lots of that spending in this green space. Um, some of the slides that we took off also would have shown you the China Development Bank, just how much they have been spending, not just on the, on the uh, technological area, financing it, but on specific companies. Uh, specific companies that are getting in the order of you know, one to two billion uh, loans, uh, dollar loans, huge amount of money. Why? Because it's a very difficult space to be operating in. But the US government does the same. It just does it in this decentralized way. It's not through a big bank. It's through all these institutions that I mentioned before. Um, and, you know, Solyndra, you might know about because it actually went bust. Solyndra got a 500 million guaranteed loan by, from Obama. Went bust. So what? They also, you know, that's part of the innovation process. You, you, you make bets. If government hadn't bet on the internet, it would not have come about. And the probability of failure with the internet was massive. It all looks easy to us now because it's there. Um, but then they also gave the same amount of money, the government, the US government, to Tesla, right? Tesla Motors today is uh, considered the new hero of, well, Elon Musk and, and Tesla, one of his companies, the new hero of Silicon Valley. Well, Tesla went well, Solyndra didn't, but if you actually look at the numbers for both VC and for the, so private venture capital, and for the kind of public institutions that are trying to do this kind of uh, creative investments, that, you know, it's basically for every Tesla, you're going to have about eight cylindras, okay? But because we don't admit the role of government on the successes, we just blame it as soon as it fails, right? So the, the, the whole cylindra uh, story has been used to bash government. Oh my God, Obama, bureaucrat, what does he know? You know, you should just sit back and somehow just facilitate things by lowering tax, but don't make those kind of investments ignoring that every technology behind the iPhone was picked, was government funded, and for each one of those technologies there was also many failures. Um, this is a big problem. And so these banks also, because we don't have a framework through which to understand them, are getting attacked. They're, they're, they're told that they're crowding out private finance. As soon as any public institution is successful, it often gets attacked. It's the mediocre ones that we kind of just ignore. The BBC, a public broadcasting um, corporation in the UK, which you probably know, it produces uh, some of the best programs in the world, is often attacked for crowding out private broadcasters. Because economists, by just talking about the state at best fixing these market failures, right, and not really understand that actually what has driven the BBC, the National Institutes of Health, unfortunately, the Department of Defense, because yes, we'd prefer that these things are not defense related, have actually been these big missions, right? These are mission-oriented investments. And what we should be asking ourselves today are, you know, what are the future missions going to be, and how can government actually organize itself to think about things, whether it's climate change, the aging crisis, youth unemployment. These are, these are the kind of missions that should be driving investments today. But by constantly telling government that it's the problem, what do we get? We get the poor, poorer uh, parts of the world. And by poor, I don't just mean financial. I mean the ones that are really hurting right now. Uh, the Eurozone, the southern periphery of the Eurozone is part of this. I'm Italian, so I'm allowed to uh, talk about this terrible word that Goldman Sachs used to describe the weaker countries in uh, uh, Europe, the pigs. This is not good. Luckily, there's that extra I there, right? So it's Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. But to be honest, we're going to have to start adding lots of letters because the narrative in Europe, but actually across the world, 
is that because it's you know, public debt that's the problem, because it's state that's the problem, these countries, how do they get out of their uh, you know, dilemma? They should spend less. And then you look at these numbers here, uh, actually lots of numbers here. I mean, we could put up education expenditure, we could put up uh, training programs for human capital formation. This here just shows you gross R&D spending as a percentage of GDP. These are the low spenders, the weaker countries around the world that are suffering, that have suffered the most after the crisis. We're not the countries that were spending the most. They were spending the least strategically. They also did not have mission-oriented public sector institutions. So in, you know, in Germany, Greece is now supposed to become Germany through all these new reforms. Well, if it wants to become Germany, let's look at what Germany has. It has a public bank, the KFW, which I just showed you is counter-cyclical, is mission-oriented. They have Fraunhofer Institutes, which are publicly funded with lots of money producing science industry links. They are not only spending a lot on R&D, but also directing that R&D spending. All right, Greece, do that. No, we don't tell Greece that. We tell it, spend less, cut your education, cut your research, cut your health expenditures, cut your workers' wages because they're being paid too much. Um, Spain, as well, has been told to do this. So Spain has cut its publicly funded research and development expenditures by 40% since 2009 in order to be like Germany. In other words, in order to get this less uh, uh, problematic division in Europe, instead it's only gonna feed the European crisis because as long as you have massive differences in competitiveness, which have not, by the way, been determined by lower wages, um, uh, we will, it's, it's, it's impossible to have a monetary union and Germany, by the way, it's often told, it's, it's often said that the reason that Germany is so successful, that it's a surplus nation, you know, country, is because they held down wages in a period that productivity was increasing. They sort of did that, but they didn't do that to uh, increase their competitiveness. They did that in order to maintain employment in a period when East and West got together. Germany would have suffered mass unemployment. Now, I don't want to defend that policy. All I want to say is that that policy in and of itself, which was actually devised to preserve employment, um, and, and I don't think the, the, the unions and the workers got the right, if you want bargaining, out of it, but that, and that is something that one has to talk about. But I just want to say what these countries are then told, the weaker countries, is that that's what they have to do, lower wages, instead of realizing that the reason that Siemens won the procurement contract to make trains in the UK, Bombardier, your, co your company which produces trains in, uh, in the UK, lost that contract is because Siemens, not because Siemens pays lower wages, but because it is part of a country that has a serious innovation and industrial policy. And Siemens itself has won all sorts of awards in terms of being one of the most innovative and green uh, companies. It's those kind of lessons that we should be learning from, not that they should just pay their workers less. Anyway, let me move on. What's also fascinating, if you look around, uh, <laughs> what's fascinating if you look around the world, and Canada is on this graph, is the degree to which we actually fund things kind of directly. You know, what do we want to do? Let's fund it when you have these public sector institutions, as opposed to indirectly through tax incentives. Canada here, the, the blue line is the indirect. The uh, white part is the direct financing. The US, which produced Silicon Valley, it's almost all direct. You want to do the internet? Do it. <laughs> you want to do uh, green? Set up ARPA-E, which today is trying to do for green what DARPA did for the internet. Um, in countries like the UK, the Netherlands, and Canada, we think we just have to facilitate this wonderfully creative business by making it cheaper for them. What happens when you make it cheaper through reducing capital gains, through different types of R&D tax credits, which are really easy to fudge, um, they hoard, they buy back their stock, and they also golf more. Uh, there's very little evidence that it increases investment. Um, and in fact, what's interesting is if you look at BIRD, not the birdie birds, but BIRD, which is business R&D spending, all right? The, the figures before I showed you were just gross R&D spending, public and private uh, to GDP, this is just focusing on the private part of it. On the horizontal, you have GDP per capita, so kind of the income of the country. Horizontal axis, how much uh, businesses are spending on R&D uh, divided by GDP. And those, that upper right-hand quadrant, which includes countries, by the way, that have wonderful welfare states, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, are on the top. And those are the exact countries that in the previous graph were also ones that fund stuff directly. Why? 
because business follows the opportunities. Business does not invest when you just make it cheaper. What drives serious kinds of investments, the smart, innovation-led growth kind of investments, or is, is the, the perception of where the opportunities are. So when Pfizer recently left the UK, they closed a big R&D lab, went to Boston. It's not because taxes are lower in Boston, they're not. It's not because there's less regulation, not. Uh, it's because of these $32 billion a year that the US government is spending on that knowledge base they need. And yet, when these companies go to government, they just lobby for these very, uh, I would call, parasitic policies. And in fact, that's what I've often been telling uh, ministers that I work with in both the UK, but also have been going across the globe talking to lots of politicians is, you know, you are, you know, you're being captured. <laughs> uh, be careful. Uh, you should be much more confident. We don't just build ecosystems. That's the now trendy word, right? Public-private ecosystems, partnerships. Ask yourself, how do you build a symbiotic ecosystem and not a parasitic one? But that conversation is not there because we keep just liking these trendy words of knowledge economy, you know, patents, uh, Silicon Valley, partnerships, ecosystems. And so the discursive battle is really to change that. I mean, you know, just think of the word de-risking. Is that what the public sector does when it you know, got together with a Xerox Park and Bell Labs to fund all those technologies that are in fact behind you know, the iPhone? No, they took on that risk. They took on that risk courageously. And that's the kind of word we have to change. De-risking does not describe it. Crowding in, crowding out. At best, I don't want to go into this because I don't have time, but at best, the Keynesian perspective, which doesn't have any theory of the state in the boom, it has a very good reason why we should be getting out of the recession by increasing government funding, but then what should it do in the boom? Just retreat? All the internet investments were done in the boom. The real question is how to guide these big changes. Um, how to use public policy in a smart way. You know, if you look back in history, the mass production revolution, right, because there's been lots of technological revolutions, mass production, IT, today we're hoping for green, even the mass production revolution, it wouldn't have completely diffused, de you know, been deployed throughout the entire economy without the state also coming in and thinking about how, how to direct that. So suburbanization was actually an outcome of policy. People didn't just wake up and want to go live in the suburbs. That was a way that governments, right or wrong, decided if you want to facilitate, especially in the US, the mass production revolution. So what we should be thinking about today, when to be honest, the IT revolution is only halfway there, if you compare it to say electricity, which took 40 to 50 years to completely diffuse, we should be thinking of green, my colleague Carlota Perez talks about this, green as a way to redirect the IT revolution to get fully deployed throughout the economy in that particular direction. But just talking about government is constantly the problem. It's not going to get us to that kind of big thinking. And the other big dilemma, of course, as we know, is inequality is just increasing, increasing. We have very little power over it right now. And I think, well, why? Because we have the wrong analysis. You know, shareholder value, which is a way that corporate uh, corporations are uh, organized, shareholder um, these are, these are uh, shareholder-based companies, not stakeholder-based companies, you know, where you have, say, workers on the board. The justification for that particular model actually is about who the risk takers are. And again, I don't have time to talk about it now, but we don't just criticize share buybacks. We shouldn't just criticize them. We should show how that, the model justifying those share buybacks is completely wrong. It assumes that it's just the shareholders that are the biggest risk takers, the only ones without a guaranteed rate of return. Everyone else supposedly has a guaranteed rate of return. Workers, the banks, and if there's something left over, the residual, the shareholders deserve it. And of course, there was a massive residual after the dot-com investments, biotech investments, and there will be a big booty, I can tell you, at the end of the clean tech cycle. And without understanding that the taxpayers took risks, workers took risks, then we shouldn't just socialize the risks, we must also socialize the rewards. And if we do that, <laughs> if we do that, not only will it be good for innovation, right, so get some of those profits from the internet that was paid for by, uh, by uh, taxpayers to fund, you know, to go back into the state, retain some equity, why not? 
Uh, there's all sorts of examples, by the way, around the world where this is done, but not in the Anglo-Saxon parts of the world, uh, to fund the next round of investments, so to fund green, uh, because we know that lots of these companies don't pay much tax, do they? So Google's algorithm was funded by the National Science Foundation, and we know how much Google pays tax. And in fact, the National Science Foundation is in massive budgetary crisis today. So not only will it be more green, but of course also more inclusive. You know, one of the most sick things that I've seen recently is the state of public schools in Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley, massive amount of state investments. I hope I've convinced you about this. And the taxpayer, the public, the public good, the school system has really suffered. You know, how sick is that? And so I really think that the only way we are going to change this narrative and stop getting these bad policies um, and stop letting uh, the, the, the risks be socialized and rewards be privatized is to change the language. And you have to really confront your government if this is what they're feeding you. I'm done. <laughs>